you already have just crossed four o'clock. So good evening, uh, everyone. Good evening, uh, esteemed panelists. We have a very esteemed panel today and good evening all participants. Thanks to the CI for organizing a very uh, interesting uh, roundtable today discussions on the TCO perspective to optimize the supply chain cost. As we all know, the topic is very close to our heart, especially it was is a, ever been a very important topic. But uh, nevertheless, post pandemic, the cost optimization on all fronts has gained a lot of focus within the organizations, not only on supply chain, including supply chain, of course, is a vital part of the entire cost, uh, whatever you carry in the organization in terms of the overall cost. So there are all around efforts to minimize the cost and uh, it is being looked from all perspectives, how to optimize this in supply chain cost. Today, we shall be focusing in our discussions on our overall TCO perspective to optimize the supply chain cost. We all know organizations are impacted by the operational, social and economic realities and supply chains are highly complex and interly connected. There are various relationships, they, they are interconnected and also the interrelationship between the various processes in the supply chain that impact the cost element. Whenever any organization is looking for a cost optimization, they always go to the procurement department or the supply chain department first to look at the areas wherever cost can be optimized. It can be optimized through the various procurement measures any organization takes and also the entire, they look at end-to-end -end supply chain also. So in the overall discussions today with all the uh, panelists, we'll be looking at the TCO concept. How is it more relevant today, especially post pandemic because TCO takes care of the total cost of the activity in the entire supply chain. And there is when you build the full visibility also of the entire supply chain in terms of the cost elements which are visible and also which are not visible to all of us. At times while having a TCO perspective, there are quite a trade-offs which are also done with respect to the KPIs in terms of which KPIs to choose and which KPI to leave. So these, these are the topics we shall be taking up today with the panelists to discuss about. But before I go to the uh, panel uh, and the flow of the discussions, we shall have uh, four panelists today. I think Mr. Sanjay Rath is also joining in a short while. So Mr. Sanjay Rath from the GSW, he is Vice President Commercial GSW. He would be on the panel uh, discussions. Mr. Samdev Mukherjee, he is Vice President Planning and Control United Breweries. Mr. Manish Gupta, Divisional Head, Spare Part Logistics from Honda Cars. And Saket Sharma, he is General Manager, TVS Supply Chain Solutions. And they are very seasoned professionals in their own fields, having multidisciplinary experience, some over close to three decades. That will be very useful. And they will, during the insightful discussions we are going to have today. And before the panel, we'll, we have a special uh, session with Mr. Gija Shankar, who is the Chief Sales and Supply, Chief Sales and Solution Officer, TVS Supply Chain Solutions. We know TVS is a spare part supplier to diverse customers, automobiles, defense, and other utility sectors. And Mr. Girja is also has been a multidisciplinary experience across enterprise in the PNL management corporate strategy. Currently, he is handling the chief sales and solution uh, officer position in TV supply chain. So, welcome all. Uh, Sanjay is also joined. Welcome, Sanjay. Good evening. I was just giving a brief introduction of all panelists. In, but before we start the panel discussions, I have already introduced the topic to the participants and uh, with our panelists. I think uh, I'll hand over to Mr. Geja to share his presentation and thoughts on the TCO perspective on supply chain. Thank you, uh, Rajneesh, and uh, welcome to all the uh, uh, you know, participants. Uh, uh, we have a very um, esteemed uh, presence here. And thank you for the CII team to take up this particular topic. It's a fairly deep conversation. Uh, just one correction, Rajneesh, before I begin. Uh, there is a TVS entity uh, called TVS Automotive Solutions Limited that supplies automotive parts. Uh, we belong to a different entity called TVS Supply Chain Solutions, which is um, a contact logistics uh, forwarding 
um, 3PL kind of an entity. So we do work for clients in managing and supporting their supply chains. Sure. Uh, so they're two, two different systems. <laughs> uh, right, coming to the, uh, the, the topic, uh, I hope my screen is visible. I'll probably just take 10 odd minutes to um, uh, take this, uh, you know, find what the uh, topic we are talking about here and uh, lay out a little bit of perspective of why we believe this is critical as particularly as a service provider or solutions provider to our clients when we go and talk to them and understand obviously the, the, the cost challenges everywhere and it is it continues to always go up. There is no letting up on that. Uh, but what we see is that many a time the conversations remain around uh, uh, the costs that are tangible, visible, and we find that uh, they may or may not be always looking at the picture holistically. So are we missing, uh, you know, uh, the so-called uh, our trees for the wood? Uh, so I think this is therefore important to look at where a particular organization's overall supply chain costs are looking at and basis uh, uh, whether these costs are uh, visible or not, but we should be looking at whether these costs are large or not. Uh, you know, so for example, uh, you know, most or most conversation tend to focus even in procurement or in uh, you know direct supply chain operations on the unit costs. But the unit costs actually hide a lot of other uh, cost elements or other uh, you know elements that can tend to be missed out. Uh, and you know, not looking at those create inherent inefficiencies in the way the operations would be. Uh, so if you look at uh, the three broad categories of uh, manufacturing organization and their cost structure, you typically will have cost of acquiring uh, goods. It could be into the plant or it could be in the you know, uh, point of consumption. Uh, this would typically include inbound you know, freight, outbound freight. It will include manufacturing costs, you know, could be import duties, things which are fairly straightforward. And from a supply chain perspective, it could include, you know, warehousing cost or direct costs that typically are paid. But uh, several of these cost elements uh, tend to get missed out. So, um, for example, uh, the, the payment terms uh, sometimes are visible, sometimes are not visible. Uh, cost of uh, running an inventory is not always very clear. And Sometimes you achieve better efficiencies, uh, you know, by reducing the overall inventory footprint while your cost of freight may, for example, may go up because that allows you to be a bit more nimble and so on. So forth. Similarly, on the operating side, there are multiple cost elements, uh, not just in the manufacturing side of the operations, but also in the supply chain side of the operations, which um, are, are large enough and quantifiable enough uh, to warrant attention. And we see that organizations sometimes miss out on those. Costs. And similarly, particularly for industries that have a large returns or, uh, you know, inventory obsolescence related costs, those elements also become very, very uh, significant and at times get overlooked by. Uh, it's a classical iceberg situation where uh, we tend to look at what is visible to us and miss out things which may or may not always be visible. And our view is that in case, instead of looking at only visible cost and trying to optimize those, sometimes it may work out to look at the uh, uh, overall cost structure. Maybe the visible cost may go up, but the hidden cost or the underlying cost structures may actually improve uh, by taking out some of these inefficiencies. So the overall idea is that implement PCO is to understand, control, and optimize the overall cost as seen by an end customer or a consumer of the goods that we are manufacturing, uh, comprising all the direct, indirect, hidden uh, cost structures, and thereby creating a systematic uh, efficiency model. Now, inherently, if you were to do something of that nature, uh, particularly from a supply chain perspective, it's important to know what kind of uh, our data sets we have and whether we have an ability to understand our own uh, you know, organization's cost structure, understand the components, understand how they apply to us. And it's not just cost accounting view, but also view of how 
the setup is and whether that setup uh, is uh, uh, robust enough to enable a uh, deep enough uh, manual analytical capability. Right? What you see on the left hand side on this chart really is is an age old uh, descriptive diagnostic predictive uh, life cycle. And it's critical in this case again as well because unless you have an ability to capture data, understand the sources of the uh, costs that are coming in, it's very hard to make any kind of a, a prediction or any kind of a analytical outcome that can help you improve the overall cost structure. Right? Uh, uh, so supply chain maturity obviously plays a significant role uh, in that organization's ability. If you really want to, so, 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 so we actually believe that uh, not every organization would be at, uh, able to take a TCO view to their uh, supply chain cost. It depends on what kind of systems and processes they have, what is the level of data aggregation and uh, data modeling capability that exists. Right? Um, but when you are able to take that view, you know we are able to see situations where both from a cost as well as from a, a value unlocking perspective, significant things tend to come out. So. You know, obviously, from a quality perspective, from a, a management cost perspective, supply cost perspective, you know, you look at the entire value chain uh, in the um, organization, all these cost elements, uh, uh, all these components would have cost elements that will have something hidden, which can be looked at and optimized, right? This may require, however, uh, significant changes in the way the organization thinks and operate. So, for example, it's very easy to go and you know talk to a trucker and say, okay, give me a give me a truck for lesser than what I'm operating, uh, but that may or may not always optimize the cost. And the answer could lie in maybe rethinking the way uh, you know you are you are going about talking to your supplier. So the benefit tends to come in when the organizations are able to look at the cost structure holistically and not department wise. And we see this quite often actually where uh, many organizations, uh, because of the way you are structured, because of the way you are departmentalized, uh, one person will look at one part of the cost structure uh, and another one will look at another part. And sometimes they are you know, competing against each other. Uh, and then you optimize at one level, it tends to create problem at the other, uh, which obviously uh, you know, brings the you know, classical local versus global optimization kind of concerns. Uh, so there is a fair degree of uh, optimization possibilities, but that can be unlocked only when the organization has that ability to look at it at an aggregate level, holistically comprising the end-to-end -end service. So can I look at, for example, my you know, logistics cost as an example, in the case of supply chain, uh, comprising the cost of inbound material, the cost of uh, material lying in the plant or in the manufacturing location, cost of distributing the material, the cost of returns, cost of other components, that tend to possibly you know, comprise because they may be sitting in different cost centers, being managed by different departments, different people, and so on and so forth. Um, so clearly, obviously, whatever, uh, you know, any kind of uh, optimization exercise has a, has a change management uh, component to it. It requires a cross-functional view to life, and it requires leadership support uh, for any kind of implementation. Um, We'll just probably take maybe one or two examples to disambiguate the whole thing and make it a little bit more tangible for benefit of our audience. Uh, and I'll maybe just uh, for interest of time, take two quick examples. So this one, what you see on the case here is a work we did where we helped a client actually increase the total ton kilometer uh, for the um, goods that they had to travel. And thereby by implying a situation where on the face of it, the cost would go up. But by doing that, we were able to drive a significant optimization in the cost of operations by breaking up the legs, by creating a better replenishment lead times, and also improve the overall availability at the consumption point or the dealer point. That uh, obviously is not very quantifiable, but we were able to see a 5% improvement in OTIF that uh, improved the overall sales. So the benefit, uh, the trade-off was that a certain minimalistic in increase in the cost of the ton kilometers in terms of the number of kilometer tires would move from the production side to the consumption side 
uh, the overall inventory got down, primary transportation costs went down, and inventory holding costs, which was much larger component and something was not very uh, directly visible, uh, came down, resulting in a net saving for the organization. While improving the experience and uh, availability for the end customers or the dealers. Maybe. Similarly, there was a, a case with a very different industry segment where uh, there was a primary leg uh, uh, where suppliers uh, were able to consolidate based on what uh, was their uh, you know, comfort level and what was optimal for them in terms of the uh, uh, type of uh, you know, crates that they used uh, for sending material. Uh, but the secondary leg and the cost at the retailer's point uh, uh, were high and those were not visible because those costs did not sit in the same you know, cost bucket because the moment it reaches a retailer point, it's not a visible cost as far as supply chain department is concerned, right? Uh, and we were able to look at this through the life cycle and identify that while we are helping our supplier because they are able to optimize the vehicle type and the, you know, utilize the crates well and therefore send bigger crates irrespective of the need of the retailer. The retailers, particularly the smaller ones that did not have the consumption were holding up inventory far higher than what they needed to hold. And that clearly, uh, you know, the moment you're able to present the case in that manner, that, you know, that, that reduction in the inventory at the retailer end uh, will give me far more saving than the cost I may actually incur so I can actually take care of my supplier uh, because they have a cost that will probably go up, but I can more than compensate him by um, you know, this benefit that I will get at the other end of the spectrum, provided I'm able to look at my cost structure in a holistic manner. So, so, so as you see, they clearly uh, uh, the ability to look at uh, data across the organization, identify where uh, efficiency in one element, if you see this case also, there is an efficient primary leg here, but there's an inefficient secondary leg and the inefficiency in secondary leg actually overcompensate the primary. And therefore, the, if you have to look at the supply chain holistically, the one that we need to optimize for is the secondary and not the primary, which was the case earlier, right? And uh, uh, such cases happen across the board. And this is a large organization we are talking about, uh, a very large kind of franchise. So it's not an issue necessarily with small and medium companies, but even large companies and particularly large companies that are highly uh, functional or uh, siloed in the way they operate tend to at times miss out on what their role cost structure looks like. Uh, I'll just pause here. It was a quick uh, uh, intro to the overall topic. Uh, but Rajneesh, thank you again for the opportunity and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Rija. It was a very insightful uh, presentation, you know, with the, especially with the live examples of the tire industry and the supply chain uh, movement across the supply chain, how the TCO concept is being applied and how the departments usually look at their own silos and their own bucket of cost. But the organ, from the organization perspective, what is important is, and also from the customer, what is important is the entire TCO concept. That's how the organizations need to look at it. Thank you very much. Uh, any, any questions we have right now or we'll take questions at the end then, otherwise. So now we have a panel discussion and uh, we have with us as already introduced you the four panelists, Mr. Sanjay Rath uh, from JSW Steel is the Vice President Commercial. Sanjay is there. So my first, uh, I'll have a, one or two questions for each of the panelists and hopefully will not, it should be around eight to 10 minutes of maximum time with one of the panel discussions, each panelist. So Sanjay, by, uh, as the global demand of steel is increasing and this demand push and supply side issues, we have already seen has caused a lot of price increase in the steel industry. How is the logistic impacting the steel price increase and its, and its impact on the entire supply chain from your perspective? Yeah, good evening, Denise. How are you? Good, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, so I think uh, today, uh, as we are seeing the uh, the business, so uh, what I could say is that there is a disruption currently in the supply chain. There's a big disruption that is happening. And today, <clears throat> this, post this pandemic, the kind of demand sprout that has happened 
and the kind of uh, uh, multimodal logistical challenges that they are coming up it is very very unpredictable and uh, today for example the shipping part of it today <clears throat> when we look at the shipping especially the containerized shipping on the bulk shipment that's a, those i mean which are, which are uh, predominantly uh, spread across the globe uh, in in various channels so there is a complete disruption so very very volatile in nature and we it's very impossible to sort of predict and uh, you know plan for future so so that is predominantly is a big challenge that is happening and because of this it has largely affected the entire commodity segment like for example today in industry like us in steel we have to uh, you know i mean uh, uh, i mean uh, what do you call it? move close to about 3 ton of material to produce 1 ton of steel 1 ton of finished good we need 3 tons 3 times so it's very very logistic intensive and the logistic plays a very important role in in steel industries and uh, uh, because of the supply chain disruption the, the price of the commodity is going hell i mean heavy so currently we are experiencing a kind of a commodity super cycle which we are normally terming it as a very very volatile in nature that means the price will continue to remain very high but while remaining high it will be volatile in nature so for example today if we look at the the way the iron ore price are moving the way the coal prices are moving or the other commodities which are required for manufacturing steel the the prices are varying you know on almost on a daily basis and the volatility is so high uh, this for example the coal price coking coal which is the, the one of the major commodity for, i mean uh, uh, required for uh, uh, manufacturing steel has almost undergone 300% increase in price so that's a kind of a volatility that we are experiencing in in uh, the uh, thing and is very difficult to predict i mean it's totally very very unpredictable kind of a scenario and we are hoping that this will continue for some more time and very difficult to say when it will end but then yes it is it is likely to continue for some more time the energy crisis in addition is also creating a lot of problem because uh, slowly the world is changing over from coal to a different uh, level of uh, uh, you know um, uh, consumptions uh, in energy consumption so that is continuously putting a lot of pressure on the energy price so energy price also will going to go go to move up so the overall the situation is very very volatile and uh, we don't see any uh, immediate uh, you know uh smoothness coming on in terms of the volatility it will continue to be remain very high and very challenging for us so that's a big challenge today the, most of the steel industries are basically uh, what you called uh, busy in terms of managing that supply chain in more efficient manner but the challenge on the ground as i mentioned is very very uh, difficult at the moment sure thanks and that was very insightful especially with respect to the volatility we are going to have so the you know we all should prepare better considering how the markets Absolutely. are going to behave at least on a short term cycle yeah uh, another one uh, question sanjay which is very important these days we talk about a lot of esg initiatives the organizations are taking of course they are taking at the corporate level especially with respect to what's happening across the world the world leaders are becoming very conscious of the entire esg initiatives on the climate change but how key is esg is a part of overall tco and the way forward for the industry from your perspective yeah for us the uh, the what we used to think about issue maybe about a year back and when we look at the issue at today there is there is there is a you know sea change that has happened there is a paradigm change that has happened because normally usually when we look at the issue we basically look at the in you know, the, the life cycle costing okay we assumes that okay this is going to operate at this particular optimum level these are the various levers which we can probably use it and see that it's not only the cost at which i am buying but yes how what is the usability of it and how is it ultimately when it is disposed of so how how the overall life cycle cost remains but today when we look at the tco the concept has totally changed because there will be something which will not remain uh, what do you call the uh, uh, which will become obsolete for example in terms of carbon as you rightly mentioned the esg kind of focus which is coming up so it is totally going to change the way we look at a product or a look at uh, at a machine or uh, anything because uh, it is going to come at a, a lot of liabilities that may come up later on which we are not aware of at the moment so for example when we set up a steel plant usually we consider you know whether it is going to be a bf bio fruit or a electric arc furnace fruit but whether this technology is has um, going to be a costly affair going ahead that we cannot predict at this stage because the carbon tax 
the uh, the um, uh, what do you call this uh, emission uh, um, um, parameters that are going to come going to be very very stringent going ahead so what impact it is going to uh, you know put it on the uh, product life cycle is very very difficult to predict at this stage but yes we know one thing for sure that this is going to be a very very big challenge going ahead so we have to consider them at this stage we have to assume that what is going to be the esg impact going ahead and we have to take factor those impact at this stage so that we remain uh, you know uh, uh, valid uh, as we go ahead otherwise we will will we'll, uh, you know somewhere down below we'll say that yes all the calculations are going hey hey whatever we had calculated before you know <laughs> the tso is totally changed in the middle so we have to sort of uh, create a more uh, uh, realistic and a predictable uh, you know uh, kind of uh, uh, mechanism at this stage when we sort of put up any capex or opex kind of uh, 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 initiative in our organization so that is currently one of the biggest challenge for uh, any manufacturing setup to remain uh, what do you call it valid for the next uh, year so that means what we normally call it that we should be fit for the future yeah. so whenever we fit uh, put something or buy something or uh, set up something we have to uh, ensure that we we remain fit for the future otherwise it's it's very difficult at this stage that's right you rightly mentioned i mean esg is all organizations are very uh, concerned about all initiatives they want to have a footprint also of the, on the esg, ESG initiatives whatever they are taking within the organization in their domains for the organizations the cost is going to be somehow intermittently increase but as we all know there will always be plan b for an organization how to take care of the cost increase but we cannot have a plan b tomorrow if you are not there then we will not survive exactly. so we need to take care of all the esg initiatives very right thanks ajay thanks for the nice and very insightful inputs thank you uh, i move over to uh, sandev sandev uh, we all as i already introduced uh, he is vice president planning and control from united prebris so i have a question like how are the government for sandev how are the government policies impacting supply chain with respect to logistics in your industry which is the prebris industry mm -hmm. thank you rajneesh for the question and thanks to cii for uh, putting up uh, such a very relevant topic for discussion uh, talking about uh, government initiatives so far as the logistics industry is concerned i will certainly speak about my industry but i will make it a little more broad based as i understand the logistics industry impacting the overall economy as a whole uh for a lack of a better word i would possibly use the term which is a little bit of cliche is whether the glass is half full or half empty i think that in one sentence sums up uh, government initiatives so far as the logistics industry is concerned now i'll first concentrate on the half of the glass which i find full and then come back to the part which is empty now in terms of the uh, good things or the as i call the glass half full certainly the expansion which has been going on on the national highways has been an excellent initiative so far as the logistics industry is concerned and we as an industry have been immensely benefited and i'm sure most industries have been benefited for the simple reason is with the improvement of condition of the roads the loadability of trucks have been increased i don't know whether uh, all of you are uh, aware of that but this is something which has happened recently uh, it if you jog my memory uh, you would recall that when uh, mr lalu prasad jadhav was uh, the railway minister at that time suddenly the railways uh, profitability dramatically improved although there was no increase in the uh, rate of uh, tickets and uh, of course now it's all in the public domain those days typically uh, like any swap politician uh, mr lalu prasad jadhav walked away with all the credit but the fact of the matter was it was uh, the idea was of a bureaucrat and he said that uh, that loadability of wagons could be increased so i why draw that analogy is that thing what had panned out in the railways uh, possibly a few decades ago that has moved to the uh, roadways and that's a uh, flip uh, to the industry the second i'll talk about is and this is uh, in the domain of half full and half empty is this business of waybills where this e permits and other things have certainly uh, made a lot of progress uh, in the life of uh, most transporters and uh, it has been a good initiative but why i call this half full and not 
uh, complete because the process is still in its uh, infant stage. Uh, while I recognize the good aspects of this, uh, but I would possibly be elated when this has completed the full cycle. When I talk of the full cycle, what I mean is if as a transporter, I can take the evil, e wable and zoom past the barricade like I do on my car. Uh, as all of us would know that we are able to do this only a few months ago. Till then, it was actually... Uh, uh, I, I mean, uh, you could also choose not to uh, go by the toll plaza by having those cards, but now it's been mandatory. I think that has yet to happen to the transportation industry. Albeit, when I say this, I'm aware that in the Southeast Corridor, uh, uh, maybe a limited part of it has already been implemented, but the Pan-India uh, implementation is uh, still uh, a long way to go. Uh, Having said these good things, uh, possibly now uh, let me refer to the part of the discussion where I say it is half empty. And the biggest drawback in this is the diesel prices. I mean, uh, we all know at least 30% of your logistics cost is related to diesel prices and no prices for guessing that that pricing mechanism is all over the place. Uh, uh, it has not come under GST like the Alcobev uh, industry, but Alcobev industry, as we understand, is more of a uh, milking cow, so every state would like to keep it under its control, which is possibly true of uh, the uh, petroleum industry as well. But what is not understood well is unlike uh, Alcove, where you can always uh, term it as a sin good and so on and so forth and uh, uh, look at it simply from a uh, garnering of revenue uh, perspective, but uh, the so far as uh, petrol prices is concerned, it has deep ramifications in the industry. Uh, you know, we talk of inflations and a whole lot of things when the diesel prices go yo-yo. So I think this is one important initiative which has to happen to keep the logistics industry in good shape. Of course, a uh, smaller part of it is uh, this, uh, 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 then that is also, I call it a mixed bag, is this uh, scrapping uh, policy on vehicles, the DS6, which is actually a good thing to happen. Uh, but uh, uh, and, and also, uh, I know for in industries like Amazon, they have moved in from trucks to battery operated vehicles. So those sort of good things have certainly happened. Uh, a minor irritant in this is again the RTO fees across states. While uh, the diesel price is a big ticket item, this is a very relatively small thing. And I think it should be standardized. Otherwise, you have the stupidity of uh, hiring a truck registered in Manipur in Bangalore. Uh, for hardly a few thousand rupees here and there. Uh, so that is another thing. Uh, the last but not the least is I think the, a lot of uh, changes in the environment is required. And while I say environment, this is one industry where you don't have the organized uh, players in this industry. Uh, I will not delve into the environmental initiatives, uh, environmental impact, what I'm talking about. We all live in this country. We know what we are talking about. Uh, but whether the law enforcing agency or whether uh, the government's in power, I think you need to take a more pragmatic view about this industry. Uh, right now, it is in the hands of a few brokers. Uh, and uh, while the trucks are being provided by a few small time vendors, so it's a very uh, difficult industry in terms of infrastructure. And if really we are going to uh, become a trillion dollar economy with this sort of infrastructure, uh, I dare say we will know nowhere be there. Thanks, Amit. Thanks for very insightful points. And, and another point where I want you to share your perspective is: uh, is TCO is PCO an effective approach in managing conflicts, especially with respect to KPIs, the organization set on cost optimization? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I think uh, the, uh, I was just going through the presentation of Girija and he was preaching to the converted. Uh, talking of TCO, I would share a personal experience, what we do in United Breweries. It's a, we call it three-stage toll gate process. Uh, when I say three-stage toll gate process, one is the initiator, uh, one is the, uh, uh, I mean, like a maker checker concept. One is the initiator of idea. The second is the validator of the idea. And third is the finance function, which does a, a checking on the overall uh, financial numbers. Uh, just to put a practical example uh, to drive home this point, the cartons, an important thing uh, 
in the beer industry or for most FMCG products. Now, there's a catch-22 situation. Uh, the tensile strength of the cartons, uh, do you strengthen that uh, uh, to keep your product safe? That's a no-brainer. You should do that. But the flip side is your costs go up. So there is always a tendency in the uh, procurement or the supply chain uh, teams to actually do uh, a little bit of cost optimization there. But then what happens is we have a quality team who does the validation of those uh, ideas that by actually trying to optimize on the cost, uh, are you actually pennywise pound foolish? Uh, maybe you optimize on the cost of uh, the cartons, but the breakages goes up uh, uh, many fold times and you lose all the benefits. And then finally, the finance function comes in the loop to do an overall uh, analysis of the cost because once the uh, project is underway, then both uh, the initiator of the idea as well as the validator of idea uh, go uh, in the sidelines because then it's business as operation, uh, business as usual. So then the finance function gets in and we keep a tab whether uh, the breakages are going up, whether this is supported by the cost, basically evaluating a business case. So uh, coming back to your question from a TCO perspective, yes, this short-term measures are very significant uh, while, uh, at the cost of the long-term measures. Uh, uh, the other point which I wanted to highlight in this concept of TCO, and, uh, and this was more a discussion with Sanjay when you talked about ESJ. Uh, uh, typically, I, I'm a finance guy and uh, 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 Rajinish, you're also a finance guy. So the logical corollary is uh, if you do a TCO, it should be lead to reduction of costs. Uh, that's a first premise, but it need not necessarily be so. And that's where I bring in the concept of ESJ and you rightly pointed out in the short term, uh, our costs will go up, but we don't have a planet B. I'm fully in agreement with that, but I would like to put a, uh, another spin to this thought. While the cost may go up in the short run, at least the industry where I represent the consumer industry, possibly uh, if you are an ESJ compliant uh, manufacturer or a company, uh, your brand equity goes up significantly high and consumers actually would want to pay for those higher prices. So although your cost may go up, you may able to pass on the cost to the consumer, provided you have a storyline. And when I say the storyline, I don't mean a marketing gimmick or that. I mean, uh, in, in all uh, humility, the actual reason why we are doing certain things, because ultimately consumers also realize that as uh, a product uh, manufacturers, we are not in the business of charity. We also need to be in business to earn decent profits. So uh, that is another important part from a TCO perspective. I would like to highlight that uh, although the cost may go up, but if you do the right things, uh, possibly that is more beneficial. And that is another perspective of looking at the TCO process. Fair enough. Absolutely. We'll agree with you on these points, very insightful. Uh, may I go over to Manish? Manish, as we know, is divisional head spare parts for Honda cars. Doesn't need, Honda doesn't need any introduction in India. Very dominant car player. So Manish, I want uh, your perspective on the point that how, is, as we know, the uh, freight constitute a large part of uh, the overall cost in the uh, when the cars are shipped from the factory or transported from the factory to the dealers across. So how is the supply chain logistic being planned, especially for the future, keeping in view of the government focus on the dedicated freight corridors and the super national highways, which are under construction in India now? So thanks, sir. Thanks for asking this question. And thanks to CII for arranging this meeting. So, sir, as I'm taking care of the spare parts logistics, so I would like to answer in that perspective. Though it would be matching the supply chain of any of the product or commodity. So, uh, uh, like we talk about, sir, government initiatives. So, that are regularly happening in terms of development of corridors or easing out the, uh, uh, say, transportation facility at various ends. So, all the measures, whether we talk about the fast track or the other things, are in the direction of faster movement, or whether we talk about the the personal vehicles or the freight, our trucks and other things. So all this is to ease out. So we we also, while planning for the logistics, we also keep the TCO in perspective in mind. So when we, while talking about TCO, it, it may happen that 
because of opening of a new corridor or any any of the new lane the total kilometers may increase or decrease so it is not always decreasing and also there may be some new tolls which we have to face but ultimately it is also important that how is the lead time reduction happening so the best way is that there is a benefit in the terms of kilometers or the total freight and there is a benefit in the lead time as well to have a 100% win win situation but when one is increasing and one is decreasing whether kilometers is increasing and lead time is decreasing so we have to give a suitable weightage to both the factors and also we have to understand like the things which have been shown in the presentation also while we talk about for example the inventories being hold due to the lead time at various ends because we are so holding the inventory dealers also holding the inventories so and in transit inventory so keeping all that in all that in mind so we do the necessary evolution and regularly the changes are being adopted wherever we have to considering the change in lead time and the kilometers so that is being practiced regularly so that means you have very dynamic policy it's, it can be adjusted based on the market requirements pretty right, fast sir. all right so a, a, another uh, point where maybe you can share a perspective as you we know that you have thousand distributors and about 800 service centers in india and sourcing these spare parts all across at times becomes very challenging in the entire supply chain so while doing so how do you keep the tco in mind the concept of tco in mind so here also sir we uh, first of all let me uh, tell you that we are a company which has not closed any of the warehouses even after implementation of gst so after gst lot many companies have as actually uh, reduced the number of warehouses but we have not opened that in terms of saving any taxation we we want to have an efficient supply chain considering tco perspective in mind so that is why we we understand that we have a jo log uh, big geographical location and we have a dealers and distributors at uh, quite a remote places also so we have warehouses at the key key points we have actually five warehouses uh, and at all the metros basically so those are covering the respective area of the dealer and distributors so we have the mechanism of consolidating the supplies from suppliers as the at the suitable location then we do the stock transfer to the nearest warehouse of the dealers and accordingly it is further distributed to the dealers and distributors so again i would say the the there may be or seems to be a direct cost of holding a warehouse but we also don't want to have a inefficient operation or we don't want to have a duplicate operations but to ease out the distribution at a faster pace and better availability to the dealers accordingly the fast moving and slow moving inventories are kept at different levels or different warehouses so all that is very transparent and it is known to dealer which material is having what time what lead time which is coming to the nearby warehouse and which part is coming from the mother warehouse so all that transparency are there into the system and also the demand keeps on changes so it is it is not i would not say that the part which is a fast selling or faster selling today will be remaining after 5 years or 4 years down the line so as as soon as the changes are there in the market we adopt it we we have a monthly mechanism of calculating all these we called it amc that basically the monthly requirements from the respective warehouses so we we analyze all this and we very frequently change the location of the material whether it is kept to be mother warehouse or whether it is kept to be to be at a regional warehouse and accordingly all this system or mechanism works to have a better facilitation to the dealers and customers thanks manish thanks for sharing your thoughts so but while doing so you are also keeping the overall tco in mind i mean yes definitely so sir we understand like we the cost of say not having the material or the cost of service we understand that part so where whatever is being calculated or whatever cannot be calculated we we both we keep all that perspective while talking about that tco fair enough fair enough. thank you all right sir yeah so now we have saket sharma he is a general manager with tvs supply chain solutions saket if uh, you can share your thoughts especially with respect to maybe this is quite relevant to tvs logistic also 
with the objective to reduce operating costs and enhance performance efficiencies. What are the emerging scenarios in the warehousing sector, especially on the warehousing sector and the challenging challenges being faced by you? If at all there is any due to government policies now. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Rajneesh. And thank you, CIA as well for organizing this webinar. So uh, to start off, I would like to pick where uh, Mr. Manish also pointed out about GST as well, that while G there was, when GST was uh, incorporated, so there was a significant change in the overall network that was, that was seen across the different companies where there was a lot of consolidation. And that was majorly because previously all of the different organizations, they were focused on the tax saving. But recently if we shift our focus to maybe two, two and a half years back when COVID-19 hit, and those that consolidation part that sort of uh, was the boon for a lot of different companies where they were not able to provide to different companies and other to their dealers and distributors. Right. So the major point that comes across from this part is that there are a lot of different factors in terms and disruptions in terms of demand and supply, which usually are out of control and they can just hit up pretty much overnight. Right. So what the first challenge that usually that we see is that you need a, a fast scalability and a responsiveness in the overall warehouse scenario. So you should be able to quickly uh, open new warehouses if you see uh, if you want. You should be quickly able to uh, serve your dealers if they attack to a certain warehouse from and shift to a, a second warehouse. Right? So this is the overall responsiveness and the risk management in the overall uh, in terms of warehouse management. Another thing that uh, we see is that usually the companies are involved in manufacturing and the uh, marketing and selling of those goods. So it is important that those are the core activities that a company uh, is, uh, is, should be focused on, right? So after that, it is basically that uh, these, the supply chain, which usually acts as one, uh, I would say, a supplemental and uh, support activity, that, that is something that usually should be outsourced uh, three, uh, as an increased 3PL participation, right? So these two points, when I combine together, so that is where the trends we see is that there is an increased overall 3PL participation uh, with advent of plug and play models, right? So uh, be it be multi-tenant facilities, and since majority of the large 3PL providers are present in a lot of different geographies and different states, it's easier for a company. So uh, just giving an example, usually what we see is that companies Companies, they will have a certain high period, uh, which is your peak demand period. In that time, the overall uh, demand for the warehousing space is higher. But uh, let's say for the rest of the eight or nine months in the year, the overall demand is lower when compared to that. So it does not make an overall sense to have that high amount of space that is being utilized. So the incorporation of 3PL participation and plug and play models gives you that flexibility and uh, as well as the response and overall responsiveness as well. Another challenge is your when you are managing the overall warehouses, when the companies are managing the overall warehouses, the overall working capital utilization, it tends to decrease, right? So in that case, again, the overall, uh, when you are outsourcing the same activities, so that is something that is again uh, targeted by that. The, new, the, the latest, the industry 4.0, where internet and the data has been playing a pivotal role. So a lot of companies, a lot of organizations have started the data collection and they have uh, incorporated the data sources that are required for the data collection part of it. But still, there is a certain change that is required in order to understand what exactly is to be done with that data. So what is the data analysis? What are the different what if analysis? What are the FF analysis? What different scenarios we can do? What is the exact information that we can carve out of the data? Right. So these. Uh, the basis that there is again an overall the trend that links directly from this is that the warehouses have in, uh, in, uh, started IoT implementation, especially in your uh, cold cold storage as well. And overall, the tech-driven warehouses have uh, taken over, and they have, they are started to the more and more tech-driven warehouses are taking over. And uh, overall, we are seeing a, a lesser manual intervention in the overall activities. Thanks, Akit. Okay. Thank, thanks for bringing all those facets on the table about, especially on the how the data is being used for management of the warehouses. And the warehouses are becoming high tech now. Going forward, of course, data is going to play a pivotal role in management of the entire business, not only the warehouse is very relevant now. Also, if you can share your thoughts, I mean, if the cost minimization KPI impact the other KPIs also in the supply chain, which are the connected KPIs. Because you know, all the departments work in this, alloy. everyone has their own KPAs, everyone has their own performance KPA also within the organization. So how does it really, or does it really impact? 
so in this case uh, i would again like to take one example so uh, when we talk about cost minimization it uh, legacy and i would say empirically it has always been okay my unit price what is what is my acquisition cost uh, what is the overall transportation that i am paying what is the total warehousing that i am paying right so when we start to see in that uh, way so in that phase when we are trying to reduce cost but there are a lot of costs that gets in that case overlooked so uh, just to so there could be some quality cost uh, it was mentioned by panel members as well that there are quality costs so there could be a supply there could there can be two different suppliers one supplier though he might be at a lower unit cost but there could be case that his quality is lesser in that case right when a such when such supplier he has a higher share of percentage and higher share of wallet in the overall supply chain what usually will happen is that if the quality is not there then there could be rush deliveries there could be expedited deliveries right uh, there it can also lead to sales loss as well right so all of these costs when we start to see so these kpis are more important so plus what i think is that there is a need to introduce maybe another and newer kpis as well okay these are the kpis in terms of supplier which need to be introduced so that an overall cost perspective is important so as a tco it's an overall cost impact uh, imp uh, imperative uh, also mr sanjarath mentioned that right now the steel prices are very high plus uh, including high volatility so again in this case maybe a demand forecasting and an snop process so these could uh, also help to have uh, maybe three or four uh, three or four months down the line uh, it's a forecast which can again where you can see okay these are the prices what i am expecting the overall prices as well and then again you can decide uh, at what cost is the correct procurement that i need to do right so these are the different ways in which uh, you can maybe link the kpis and maybe introduce a new kpis as well sure thank you thank you for sharing your thoughts so i think uh, from the, from my perspective or all the panel perspective maybe the participants also it was a very insightful session for me and quite a learn, learning lot of learnings for me as well on the entire logistics supply chain in the tco perspective but uh, we need to have maybe if we have some questions from the participants can i can i i, I don't see currently but if the participants have any questions they can please put it on the chat box so we can read and then allocate the questions I don't see currently any questions here. Does anyone anyone have any questions? They can please put it on the chat box. So someone is requesting to get a recording of the session from the ca to all the participants ca need to look into this if it's possible one of the question which has come from the participant oh it's moving very fast how do i see considering the drastic increase in the fuel cost how do we work out the how do we work out for control of transportation cost which is direct <laughs> impact on supply chain cost <laughs> this is relevant for all panelists any anyone can answer I, I i think it affects all of us as a person also as an individual also maybe sanjay if you can yeah, yeah just to tell you see thing is today which is more volatile always you have to build in as mechanism to address it so for example when we have to we are procuring say a lot of raw materials or equipment and all today what is happening is most of our uh, uh, seller are asking for a variable kind of pricing mechanism. So that means, for example, if it's an import item, they're saying that I will give you a FOB price. I will not give you the CIF price. So that means at the, when the material is ready, you go to the market on whatever is the, uh, the price at that moment, you please pay that price. Yeah. So that has become a very, very uh, common affair nowadays because very, very difficult to predict that how the logistic uh, price are going to play out so people are not so only anything which is going to come out a later date then i think it is better that we built in this kind of mechanism of variable pricing if the price goes up that's because that's the actual price that you will be paying at the time of delivery so uh, and it's better to put it in that manner so that means to say like let's say there is a item which is coming from far off and if it is coming to a multimodal route or a, uh, this thing so usually if you feel that you know there is a uh, 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 a lot of volatility is there in the market in terms of logistic price, then better to 
give them a price which is on the x work basis and say that okay before one week once the material is ready then i will send you the form offer for uh, uh, for the uh, on on the door delivery price but if you have a better transporter who can transport it at a much cheaper rate then you can also uh, you know <clears throat> this thing but normally in the steel industries where the uh, deliveries are very short let's say one or two months time usually we give them a delivered price but when the somebody asks for a, a longer delivery period then we do not give them a form price we always give them a extra price and we say that we will tell you the delivered price at the time of or maybe one week or two weeks before the delivery so the same is the case uh, with our uh, when uh, uh, vendors also so they do also when the long delivery items are there so they ask for a price variation clause that's right that's right this is how you manage your risk within the organization everyone has to look at exactly it. so it's a part of the risk management and today nobody you know whenever there is a volatility so they built up a price variation clause absolutely so sandeep uh, another question i have maybe if you can take it every company is working in the silos in logistics and if all the companies collaborate and don't compete with each other in the industry then we maybe we can have economies of, of optimized economies i don't know how this will work in the reality but no we we do lot of collaborative kind of logistic arrangement among uh, i mean for example let's say for example if i am uh, buying coal from say australia wherein i have a half ship load of uh, uh, quantity available and if somebody else also want the remaining half so then we do, because we if you if you book a ship uh, i mean uh, the ship also depending on the size has a lot of variation in logistic cost for example if you are going for a supramax sort of a vessel or a kip vessels the price the, the difference between kip and supramax is almost 35 to 40% so in case i have only half the i mean uh, i mean uh, panamax vessel load and somebody else is having the remaining 50% available for uh, during the same time maybe a port which is near to each other so then we do collaborate to get uh, the shipment uh, shared so we do that many of the cases uh, when there is a bulk shipments are happening say for example for coal or iron ore for or uh, uh, fluxes which we normally usually import from say australia or uh, uh, korea or japan or in from those places or china for example so then we do do a collaborative kind of arrangement in terms of this thing but uh, uh, so but when it comes to smaller consignments so in this question of for example when i am sent, sort of sending my steel to my customer so i don't usually look at you know carrying my my competitions <laughs> value walls so so usually that's not happening i mean uh, so but yes uh, when there is a bigger consignments coming up and the, the uh, benefits are very huge we do collaborate similarly in, in the, i mean in railways of course uh, that is happening for example when i uh, supply the steel from let's say from my plant which is in uh, in the south to north then again it when it comes back from north to south it also carries the steel commodity so that way railway always has that kind of a collaborate di indirectly fulfilled but in the road segment also it is happening for example uh, uh, today when i sell the uh, my finished steel uh, to let's say punjab or somewhere in the back they bring the tractors and come back and you know so they they do indirectly though not directly but indirectly the, that kind of a collaborative arrangements are happening people are getting return loads but if you compare uh, with uh, other countries our i mean uh, number of vehicle or vessels which are coming back return empty is quite huge to the extent of 30 to 35% of our uh, you know cargo carrying vehicles usually have uh, 30 to 40% of empty returns which is which is very huge and uh, but as compared to other countries where it is less than 15% so that means we need a more digital uh, you know ecosystem wherein this kind of collaboration is possible otherwise you know everybody it's very difficult unless you have a common platform through which everybody can collaborate and see at that time when the you have to do a shipment whether somebody else vehicle is free so that is happening at the stage it has come down from a level of 55 to 60% before to a level of around 40% now but yes there is there are there are uh, you know a number of possibilities that is there you know more more uh, leg rooms are there for us to sort of optimize and thereby reduce our logistic cost thanks sanjay it was very you know thoughtful of this collaborative approach because going way forward i think it decision making the savings here also come from a collaborative approach for the business only yeah right 
So second, if you can take this question, there's the next question, uh, since you touched on the topic of digitalization, how is the digitalization of logistic transportation seen in a TCO perspective, especially with respect to visibility and digital twinning? Digital twinning, yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, when we talk about visibility and digital twinning, so I would, uh, so digital twinning basically is just a very broad, uh, would say what is happening across your network and visibility is what is happening across the nodes as well. So what is the, my GIT when, when I, be, I will be doing my GRN and everything. So uh, how does it essentially will help you in the TCO perspective is that uh, first of all, the major will be impact will be on your working capital. You will have a very clear picture around your overall inventory holding and where exactly your is, is inventory lying around. Right? You will have you will be able to better know okay what is my overall quality, whether my GRN was there, whether the supplier that had sent. I you will be able to quicker realize whatever your total in. You will be able to make quicker decisions in that aspect as well. Right? So when you see uh, another aspect would be uh, let's say. I would say the theft or pilferage, these things keep happening, right? So again, when you have a visibility and all these things, you are keeping constant track of those. So it becomes easier and the overall decision making becomes faster for you. Right? So that is how I think is digitalization can be, uh, visibility can be. Thanks. Thanks. Manish, uh, another question quite relevant to your industry also, and maybe in general also, the global scenario during the COVID or maybe during we are still in COVID period. The international logistic costs have impacted huge delaying the shipments, higher freight, etc., which has also impacted the domestic freight as well. So, how do you see this as a scene improving in the future, near future? Sir, actually, no. if we talk about, say, uh, like we are talking about that domestic logistics. So, we generally believe in our long term contracts. So, and like, uh, it was also being talked about uh, like the fluctuations or the impacts of uh, increase or decrease in fuel are being taken in care in the contracts. So this is how we work. So we understand that apart from COVID, they, not only COVID, but also there are seasonal factors like there are festive season and somewhere there is a di difference in demand and supply between the two states. So all this also impacts but whenever we finalize the contracts, whenever we do the biddings on the certain things and we go for the supplier selection, so we to take all these into accounts. So nobody is from the either side, if the rate are decreasing drastically, though it is not never happening or it is increasing a little bit, only that the fuel factor is which we take care of from either side, sure. supplier and our yeah. side. This, this is how we work in a very, very transparent and all these are written in the contracts. Uh, maybe if this is the last question we can take in the panel. Sandev, if you can close collaboration between the purchasing department of each industry will help reduce cost by a round use of trucks, by round use of trucks. It means the reduced reduction of the turnaround time. It looks to me like this, maybe. Yeah. Uh... I think there are two parts to this question, if I understand. First of all, uh, as the question suggests, we are not in the business of packaging. So that's the first uh, clarification I want to do. Uh, we are in the business of selling beer. Uh, but yes, uh, in terms of, uh, I'll, I'll split it into two parts. I, I think uh, the first part, which is talking of packaging, and uh, if I understand right, it is talking of round the clock. I mean, it doesn't really work that way. But in terms of our finished products, for certain markets where, again, uh, customer serviceability is an issue. Uh, I mean, it is more we are try trying the best out of a bad bargain. We keep dedicated trucks. Uh, so while the customer service uh, improves and the brand loyalty and the customer uh, satisfaction goes up, but again, the other example which I gave in from the TCO perspective on ESJ, it's not really a, a cost-saving uh, measure as such. Uh, so I don't know whether I've answered the question because I didn't understand uh, the context in which the question was uh, asked, because as I said, we are uh, not in the business of packaging, uh, but uh, the uh, other part which we can slightly touch upon is yes, uh, in terms of our bottles, we have recyclable bottles. Uh, uh, so from that perspective, yes, uh, we try to uh, minimize our cost, but that is nothing to do with logistics per se. 
you already answered the packaging part of it also i think other questions are more or less similar to what we have already you know taken for the discussions i don't see that we again take all those questions because they are similar to what have already been answered by all the panelists i think so one question which has yeah. uh, been asked is that uh, whether the is the ev segment in trucks are increased uh, in logistic so uh, so we are the company which very committed to this esg so we have started this uh, in fact tata steel also has started and we are also starting shortly so we are trying to induct uh, very heavy duty uh, what do you call electric truck for our outward movement of i mean uh, uh, consignment to our vendors so uh, and we are going to do that in a much bigger scale uh, currently the charging infrastructures are not there so we have to do only the smaller haul maybe about uh, less than 100 km kind of a lead from our plant or from the warehouses so uh, what we saw is that uh, over a period of time like means if you have to talk about the total tissue concept of the total life cycle costing and over a period of time uh, the cost will come down if we go sort of a tissue kind of mechanism but currently what is happening is the cost of the batteries are very very high and but it is it is coming down it's it's very rapidly it is it is uh, it's coming down and we hope that at some point of time it will it will attend the break even but at today's uh, cost yes if you are looking at some sort of a five years kind of uh, horizon in which you have to uh, you know own the truck maintain it properly and do a proper uh, uh, at least a minimum of 200 kilometers of haul every every day yes it is sustainability it can be it can be cheaper than your existing uh, cost of transportation by uh, the uh, the commercial vehicles it is it is possible and in fact we have uh, uh, deploying almost about 40 vehicles in the phase 1 and another 100 vehicle in the phase 2 so it's a small beginning that we are doing we do close to about some 50000 uh, trips a day kind of uh, um, i mean the the domestic uh, segment uh, supply chain is concerned so out of which maybe 5 to 10% is what we are targeting to convert to ev which is basically the short haul which is less than 100 km kind of a range and there we see that over a period of 5 year if i to do a complete issue then the uh, rate per kilometer per ton is is less than the current rate that which i am doing the transportation but only thing is that this uh, the capex is very high so there will be a initial huge investment that is that will be happening and the normal transporters will not do that if you ask a normal transporter to put a vehicle for you for 5 years and you know uh, run it on a per ton per kilometer kind of basis very few transporters will be willing to do that so we have to do it ourselves which currently today you know we we basically outsource this kind of activities but yes if we do it over a period of time there are there are sustainable there are cheaper than the existing uh, you know commercial vehicles really very fair sanjay we need to as a country we need to have a infrastructure ramp up the infrastructure very fast for ev charging whether it is on the trucks or the cars if we have to meet the global standards for the it is, it is, it is catching up i think it will take time because today we don't find any big commercial vehicle manufacturers are come up with tv uh, big uh, heavy duty tv uh, ev vehicles yeah. currently we have to import these vehicles so that's one of the reason why the cost is very high but once the we start uh, production of these vehicles in india and the battery price comes down yes they can give you serious big challenges to the uh, what do you call this uh, diesel vehicles we can uh, it, it, it the, in fact the price will be ch cheaper than 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 diesel i see in germany in which uh, all of you also are aware must be aware that they have started a electric corridor on the highway 200 yeah. km on a trial basis so which runs right. parallel to the normal autobahn but hopefully it works then whole world neo will converge gradually is converging to the ev Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's it's catching up very fast. I think maybe it's a matter of time. Uh, we will slowly start replacing the heavy duty vehicles with electric. Yeah. So I think uh, all of the questions also we have taken most of it. I don't see any other question which is different from what we have already taken up. So from my perspective, I think uh, uh, we can thank the panelists for taking their time out. The entire esteem panelists, Gidja, Sanjay. Samdev Saket Manish thank you very much for making this session very insightful and lively it was really very uh, for me very knowledgeable session i take a lot of learnings from this maybe the same cases with the participants also thank you very much thank you thank you it was pleasure thank you cii for arranging thank you cii thanks cii for organizing this session so thank you bye bye